Leading today's webinar, Robotics and Compliance, Important Tips, Tricks, and Facts for Success, Arshayash Desai, C CEO of Corixer, and Frank Boney, VP of Operations at Smythe. So without further ado, I'm pleased to turn the program over to our first presenter. Take it away, Shayash. Shayash, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. Is anybody else hearing, Shayash? No, I'm on mute. I apologize. No, sorry no worries. That. No, no, please, go right ahead. Um, so thank you, Patty. Appreciate it. Um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's exciting always to be participating with RBCF in these kinds of events. Uh, for everyone who's joined the webinar, we appreciate you joining us with all of your busy schedules. Uh, Frank and I have thought about making this a, a quick webinar. It's a 30-minute webinar. We could run over to 45, not the typical uh, full 60 minutes. Our whole idea was to kind of give you a quick syn synopsis uh, open it up for time and questions and, and hopefully keep it fairly interactive uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, so with that, I'm going to kind of, you know, walk through the slides and show you, um, you know, share with you where we're, um, where we're headed today. Um, right, so background, you, you, we we're going to get the slides, um, you know, Patty described, uh, you gave, gave you some sense of where we're coming from. Um, you know, uh, I bring much more of a technology perspective to the conversation. I've been in, in you know, technology and in AR for a number of years. And my colleague, Frank Boney, is a, a, a practitioner with a lot of deep background in deductions, you know, having dealt with um, uh, work around forensics and recoveries. So he really brings the practitioner point of view. That's a, that's a good balance to, to what I contribute to this, uh, this program. Um, in terms of you know, where we are today, um, it's a CRF survey, RBCF was a co-participant uh, 2023 survey, and, you know, comparing to 2021, what's interesting is that the uh, the overall trend in deductions is up. So there was a 38% increase in the number of people that um, said they were experiencing an increase in deductions between, between 21 and 23. Um, and Frank, I, uh, you know, your perspective on how things stand right now? It, it's actually trending in the same direction, especially as um, the retailers are getting more sophisticated, <clears throat> excuse me, um, regarding their internal um, automation and what have you. So they set the yeah. bar a lot higher and we're seeing a lot of uh, deductions continue to increase. Yep. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, it is a big problem. I think for those of you that have, you know, joined this call, hopefully you're you're experiencing a similar pattern. Um, but you know, if you think about the the challenges experienced, and I'm going to have uh, Frank talk to this because he he absolutely lives this, um, you know, every day in how he supports clients, um, you know, large and small, dealing with retailers and dealing with sort of resolution of deduction issues. So, Frank, I'll let you talk to this one. Sure. Um, these are one of the greatest challenges when dealing with big boxes and mega retailers. Um, overall, the increase in requirements to meet dispute timelines and assessments of deductions are ever growing. Uh, whether shipping timelines, labeling issues, fulfillment demands, ODIFs, uh, shortage claims being taken, or even validating sales incentives, co-ops, uh, deduction volumes continue to increase and are high. There are tight windows in disputing claims if they are invalid. Some retailers have very short timelines to enter a dispute, could be as short as 30, 45, or 60 days. In that timeline, the gathering information and review takes time and needs to be done quickly. If not, you may miss your opportunity to, for your dispute window. The data transcription errors in requesting support or even having a typo in a submittal can either delay or not, um, avoid the opportunity to have a dispute accepted or created. Also, when it comes to audits, um, having information available is very important. Audit claims normally come at the most inappropriate time, inconvenience, um, PODs or BOLs, depending on the carrier or the warehouse, uh, may not be available as past their retention timeline. So it's important as we're experiencing all these uh, increased time restrictions, as well as all the demands that are taking place, what information can help us in order to um, counter, as well as to make sure that we have um, 
all the proper ammunition to when we find out a, a particular dispute needs to be done for an invalid deduction. That's where we're talking about some of the challenges today. Thanks, Frank. Um, so you know, just to summarize, you know, when we talk about RPA, what are we referring to? I mean, it's essentially the acronym is RPA, but Robotic Process Automation. And fundamentally what you're doing is you're, you're programming a computer or a computing system to do routine human tasks. You know, in some cases, people call it robots. robots. I mean, some people call it bots. The idea being you're really trying to script out in software what the computer needs to do. So what, what, what does that, uh, you know, highlight for you? I mean, it's simple things as pulling documents from emails. It could be downloading documents from a website or an AP portal. It could be uploading documents, um, example, proof of something or disputing as the case may be. It includes things like, you know, uh, in built into that is optical character recognition where uh, document, you have the ability to read documents. So the computer has an ability to read a document. And then probably the most important thing is being able to then trigger off certain actions on the, on the deduction side, mainly, um, you know, what kind of a deduction is it, you know, co co reason coding it and then triaging it to either a manual workflow or auto disputing as a case may be. So you may find something is a trade discount that's wrongly taken, you auto dispute it in the portal, right? So that's just an example of, um, of, of triggering new workflows. And so they could be automated or we call assisted. And then, um, you know, when you think about it, what is it really doing for you? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really eliminating the routine tasks so that you have the time to then spend on strategic things, managing the customer relationship, handling settlements, things of that sort. So really what it's doing is taking out the login, the search, the cut, the paste, the log back in, the upload, all of that is kind of being cut, taken out of the cycle. So at the end of the day, when you think about how, we, certainly how we think about uh, robotic processes, is it's not just about extracting data from a portal. It's about extracting data from an email. Uh, some of your retailers might be sending you regular emails with remittance documents attached to it. Um, so being able to open it up, read a PDF, or pulling a document from your shippers' uh, portals, or pulling documents from your ERP, and bringing it all together, attaching it to the line item, categorizing it, you know, putting all of it into a single folder so that it's saving you the time in, in collecting and collating data, right? That's one of the times, uh, one of the elements of time that uh, people lose a lot during the, uh, during the day. And, and at the end of the day, you've got these workflows that help you validate and invalidate, and that's what a typical deduction system would do. But at the front end, you've got RPA really helping you garner all that data together. And on the back end, any great system should really help you with better reporting, right? Being able to look and track your recoveries, looking at your resolution times by deduction type, by customer, that's really what the back end is intended to do. So the moment you digitize the front end with RPA, and workflow, you've got a tremendous opportunity to improve your reporting on deductions, which is obviously a great pain for uh, for most uh, suppliers to the uh, to the retail industry. Um, if you look at the key trends in RPA, uh, there are a few things that you should keep in mind if you think about setting up these robots. For those of you that have, um, you know, that's a that's a step in the right direction. But this is just what we see are the big trends in the technology side of things. Number one. The tools are much easier to use, which means that business users can actually set up these robots, which is very cool. Uh, secondly, they are much more affordable than they were even five years ago. And the technology is getting a lot friendlier with you know, poor quality documents and things of that sort, or being able to digitize the document. Um, the AI capability around handwriting and interpreting pictures, as you probably know, I mean, a lot of us have heard a lot about ChatGPT. These large language models are now allowing for deciphering, reading, and things of that sort that's getting very exciting. Uh, also equally important we've found, I mean, you know, there's a, it's pretty easy to go into an Amazon portal or a Costco or a Walmart portal. These are fairly well-organized big box retailers. There's a lot of retailers that still do it, certainly in the apparel industry, for example, or in the gaming industry, um, you know, that are uh, very much still doing email and PDF or doing EDI, right? So. The process of extraction and bringing it together has to be all around. The other thing that we're noticing a lot is people, you know, you, you sort of think, okay, I'm going to create a robot for, you know, my three biggest customers. And that's absolutely the right way to do it. 
but increasingly there's pressure to go to all customers, right? To automate wherever there's higher volumes, try and get to sort of the 80-20 rule. I mean, cover 80% of my volume that maybe is hitting 20% of my customers. Um, it's integrated with cash application. For those of you that are familiar with cash application, I mean, essentially, this is where the remittance detail comes in at the cash application stage, stage along with the payment and being able to identify deductions or, uh, you know, track down unidentified deductions and being able to go back and pull out debit memos from portals when you don't have something in a remittance document is an example of the kinds of things that a robot can do. And then the last thing I'd say is that, you know, come, coming up very quickly here, as I said uh, up front, there was um, more and more what we're going to see in the next two to three years is these robots using large language models will be able to read uh, websites, we will be able to read documents, we'll be able to discern and sort of highlight where uh, where the data is. And, and we're going to be, all of us are going to be pushed, whether you within your companies or us as vendors, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be pushed to do a lot more in that regard. So really quickly in terms of, you know, uh, if, you, if you get a sense of how these uh, robots work, as an example of a robot logging into the Amazon portal. Um, you know, it's obviously been trained to figure out where in the portal, where in Vendor Central to go, uh, where to pick up the chargebacks, which part chargebacks to pick up. Obviously, it's doing it on a daily basis. It's probably a night job. And what's happening on the right-hand side is the speed with which the robot's pulling out the different files, right? So the whole idea is, how can I speed up this process so I save time and I'm not going to have to do all that and have all that data readily available at the end of the day so that, you know, where it's hundreds or thousands, multiple customers, right? In seconds, as you saw over there, we were able to pull up, you know, wherever it was, about a hundred, a couple of hundred uh, files. Um, and then, you know, obviously that gets translated into a system, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Same thing with, let's say, Costco. I mean, another example, this is just a, you know, you, again, it's a different website, but robots obviously are trained to think about, okay, I'm now in a different portal. Uh, there may be things like multi-factor authentication as is happening over here. It has the ability to intercept the email and pick up the code, key it in, go to the right section of, of this case, Costco Hub. And obviously it's gonna pull up in the in the payment portal, it's gonna pull up the, um, the remittance documents, start to download them, very similar to what we just saw in the Amazon scenario. Um, obviously the names here are, are screened out because it's client sensitive. But the idea is it's it's learned this, and from time to time there will be changes. You know, oftentimes a website does make. I mean, the retailer will change the website. So an important part of this is training robots or preparing them to change with with website changes or security protocol changes. So just um, you know, kind of give you a sense of how it's working, how it's how it's playing out. This is obviously very important to getting all the remittance detail, uh, pulling out you know, but basically pulling out the uh, the, the the relevant documents. Um, this here is a good example in the Macy's Bloomies example of how it's going in, pulling out a particular debit memo, and how it's actually going to attach the debit memo now to a line item, right? So this is not just about uh, bringing out the details, uh, digitizing the contents from the website back to you in your ERP or in some third-party system, but also being able to give you, this is a robot going into the right section of the Macy's site, knowing what doc number it's going to do a lookup on it's going to do a lookup and then you you know it pulls that document and pulls it into the system where now it's viewable uh for the user right so for the deduction analyst more importantly it's also going to capture the status codes convert that right into your recent codes your status codes um and another good example here is actually it's gonna look and keep trying. So let's say it fails, I mean, you know, you know, debit memo fail is a DMF code. Um, and then, you know, hopefully move from DMF to DMR, which is it's received. So the, the robot has the ability to be trained to keep trying. So if you, you're you in a website, you know, you, you get logged out, you can't log in, or you log in, you couldn't find a debit memo, you, you have to log back in in a couple of hours, it's gonna do that repeat job for you, right? So that's just, one of the things that's nice about robots is you can teach them to keep trying till they fail. When they fail, they should tell you they failed. I think that's a very, very important part of the program. Um, and then, you know, I think we touched on it briefly, and I'm, I'm running these videos just to give you a flavor of what it's like. You know, obviously, we cover, you know, 35 plus different retailer portals. 
um, you know, that we, we get much deeper into the portal dynamic. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the best practices we picked up. But really, at the core here, what you've got is, um, you know, a, uh, an ability to not just pull the documents, read them, and then figure out which ones you want to dispute. So here's an example of an Amazon dispute process. I mean, for those of you that deal with Amazon shortages, this is just a case illustration of that. Um, you know, you get, um, it, you know, we have clients that will want to dispute every shortage. We have clients that will say, we want to dispute it under certain conditions. We'll pick up the POD. Frank's actually going to talk to that in a moment. But the whole idea is you can teach the computer logic to then go, okay, now you can go ahead and dispute it. So it's logged into Vendor Central. It's pulled up the doc numbers. It's going to dispute. It is going to the very specific transaction types, and it's going to submit multiple disputes at one shot. It's going to pick up the dispute IDs. So you're going to see that in a moment here. It's, it's putting some reasoning into the dispute uh, language, submitting it and it's picked up the dispute ID. And one of the nice things with this kind of process uh, in a robotic process is you can then alert yourself in 30 days to say, hey, either if there's a denial, alert me, or if there is a follow-up required for a denial, let me, uh, or, or no action on a dispute, you can do a 20-day follow-up. And that's a reminder to the deduction analyst to do certain things, right? So the whole idea is to really make this so that you're not having to deal with portals and emails and post-its and Excel and all that kind of stuff. We want to try and eliminate all that, right? That's the fundamental of what's going on here. What's nice about these technologies, it's not just ours, but, you know, there's a lot of vendors that do this, um, is that, you know, it's becoming increasingly more flexible, right? So we like that aspect because I think a lot of what I'm going to speak to now in a moment here is, um, is you know, kind of the, the best practice. Um, I think the, the other thing that I would point out, and, and Frank will get into the detail, is, you know, oftentimes you, you're out, whether it's a shortage or, you know, a disputed invoice, um, you, you need the PODs, you need the BOLs, um, you, need, you need, a, need a PIC number, or whatever it is, those are examples of, uh, of uh, documentation that can be pulled. Oftentimes these documents are hard to get, may need them for audit purposes down the line. So the whole idea is we really recommend to clients that, you know, for things like uh, PODs, it's good to just go grab them because the cost to grab a POD is not very high. And, uh, you know, they, they know how to, they, they do it very efficiently and we store them in our cloud, right? So that's an important best practice because you know that certain carriers are not going to host it beyond 30 days, 90 days, 120, depending on the carrier. So, you know, the whole idea is give you all the backups so that if you have to come back to it nine months later, you always have some proof, right, in your, um, in your system. And, um, and so that's just an example. In terms of o OCR, um, and I talked about that earlier, optical character recognition, the AI aspects of this have got way better, right? So I think language recognition capability or handwriting I think the computer beat the human's ability to read handwriting in 1996. People don't realize that. It was a pretty long time ago. But I think the advances in, in, um, in uh, AI, in LLMs, in natural language, um, the kind of new technologies you hear about, um, you know, companies like Microsoft and others have phenomenal tools to actually read even handwritten documents. So here's an example of a remittance document with, which is about 38 pages. It's, uh, it's about 1300 line items. And this is an example of how we're training a robot to actually read the document so that in the future, when these monthly or daily documents come in or we get them through the robotic process, it's basically reading the top document on the top left here and dropping the flat file uh, data down below. Right? So you saw that and this whole thing, you know, setting up one retailer, one remittance statement, um, you know, it doesn't matter which retailer, this one's a German retailer, so it was a language translation as well. Took, it took about, you know, it took about five minutes for the, for, the, for the program to be set up, right? So it's a, it's a pretty simple process, and that's my point. I want to try and demystify how these things are actually done. Um, you know, I'm going to transition very quickly into a couple of slides, and then I'm going to um, actually... Um, pause here for a minute. Frank, you know, I know I ran through a, a few slides there. Anything you want to add? To, you know, some, oh, to, to your point of extracting the remittance information, I mean, sometimes by having that information, as well as whatever coding may be um, on a particular remittance for a deduction type, it helps as well. So you could 
isolate knowing ahead of time that yes, there's a deduction, but what type of deduction is it? Is it a shortage? Is it a violation? Is it a co-op? By having that done through this extraction process, it helps immensely in cutting to what the true cause or what's the true uh, deduction at hand and able to direct or look forward to, okay, the next step is the shortage. What is the trigger in um, another action? Also, yeah. Sean, you mentioned before, I mean, about all these bots and how wonderful they are and things work out great, especially the scraping. I just want to be transparent with everyone. These are great tools. It, you're creating a virtual coworker, should we say, with you. But it doesn't fully eliminate some of the research that may be needed by an individual to do in validating certain things. Yes, all the aids are there. You have the information. It minimizes the time frame in which they have to go ahead and I guess to your um, slide that you had before, getting down to the 80-20 rule, getting to 20% of those items that may have to be a little bit more deep dive to be done. But again, automation, robotics, and what have you does help immensely in getting to that true 20 that you have to look at. Yeah, no, thanks, Frank. That's, uh, that's a great point. It's an aid, it's not a replacement. So uh, I think too often we get lost in the AI and the buzz and, and uh, the important thing here is it's, you know, view this as a productivity tool and nothing more, right? It's not gonna reinvent deductions. It's gonna simply make it easier on your time and, and how you focus your efforts. Um, so strategies to deploy, and you know, this is something that we were, we, we sort of, you know, if you want to execute this as a program, the first thing we recommend to clients is first of all, you know, find your most repetitive, low value add tasks that you believe can be performed by bots. And, you know, it, it means actually taking a little bit of time in the department to say, which are the ones that are the most painful, right? Um, and, and think through all the tasks you go through, right? Not just within the portal, but even within your company, follow-ups and things of that sort, pulling documents from different places, going to a shipper portal, right? So think of the things that you need and, and, that, and that becomes the beginning of what I say is stakeholder buy-in. Uh, one of the things we know from our, uh, from our metrics is that this is gonna save 80% of your time that you would typically spend in a portal. And to Frank's point, you're not going 100%, right? We, we're not doing, mm -hmm. this is not a replacement. So you're gonna, it's gonna save you the portal time, it's gonna save you the email time, it's gonna save you some of that follow time, some of the mistakes that may happen because you forget about a window within, within which you have to, let's say, execute a dispute or, you know, on, let's say, a shortage as an example with Amazon. So, um, and, and getting buy-in is important, obviously various ways in which you can build the ROI metrics for that. The next thing is to spec and configure, right? So, uh, which is, you know, do you, uh, how are you gonna do this? Um, what are all the actions that you want the bot to perform, right? Let's say you want them to extract documents, reason code mapping, you want them to handle disputes, right? Um, and then the next thing is, you know, um, setting up a, a retailer, or in some cases, a distributor to, um, with the, the appropriate workflows. And that's what Frank was saying, is like, you've gotta have something that says, okay, this is a shortage dispute, it's a damaged goods problem, um, you know, um, I want this to go to this group in, in let's say quality control or merchandising or, or in, uh, in, in, you know, in, in the warehouse, right? So, the, you know, getting into the right places is as important as it is to saying, I got the data, it's not enough to just get the data. It's gotta, you gotta put the data in the right people's hands. Um, the next thing that we talk about a lot with clients and generally that we recommend is, you know, how do you set this up? The first thing is, you know, what, how do you approach it? There's two parts. One is set up, the other is you've got to maintain it. And within that, you have to decide whether you're going to do it in-house or you're going to use a vendor. Um, and there are pros and cons to each. And, and, you know, if you've got a technology team that is equipped and ready, doing it in-house is great. Um, but if you're going to do it in-house, the thing that we highly recommend is that you you know you have pretty tight tight SLAs with whoever it is you're dealing with internal or external have SLAs around turnarounds or site availability or performance or non-performance of you know pulling documents right as an example has it been consistently pulling the PODs is it seeing too many fails on the POD retrieved right so that's important the next thing is having alerts and dashboards I highly recommend this which is really knowing which robots are up for the day, which ones are out, which files are coming in, which ones are not, and being able to have alerts out to yourself. If it's a vendor, then the vendor needs to get those alerts and be able to, you know, alert you, um, you know, vendor being the technology vendor, 
uh, alert you to um, you know the issues, right? And then the last thing you want to do is um, have a path to resolution, meaning when a bot fails, what's your resolution time? What's your recovery time? How quickly can you bring that up? That's part of the SLA process. But you, you know, there should be a point person in engineering or in technology and IT who is point to be fixing the issues. Um, we oftentimes will see things where, you know, particularly these days, we're seeing a lot with Amazon, right? Where they'll change a website constantly. And so being on top of that has been our number one priority, right? You know, we just have to do it daily. Um, and, and the frequency of change is high. So again, having a path to resolution is very, very important. Um, before I flip to the next slide, Frank, anything you want to comment on here or move to the no, next slide? No, just to echo your point there, but making sure the maintenance and the alert mechanisms are there because um, that's critical because without that, a bot maybe you're thinking it's running, going back, looking at it, you're not sure, um, you look at the end result data and it's saying, hey, what's happening? Nothing has been output by having a daily, hourly, minute by minute, you know, accountability for what's the bot doing, it helps. Um, so you, the alert, me mechanism, uh, alert mechanism, whether internal or external, is very important. Um, also, the strategies to deploy, um, it may seem simple, and we're talking about some of the, the basic items, like uh, retrieving PODs, going ahead and disputing certain, certain areas directly. Um, however, doing an assessment of your processes and looking at directly what they mean may be needed a bot could be used in any aspect whether it be in your uh, deduction handling or maybe just just the overall process improvement of different direction that's given so it's not just limited to what we're showing here today or going to certain things it can be built upon as well yeah it's a great point frank the the flexibility is important here um because no two organizations, no two suppliers are the same, and certainly every retailer is different. So I think we we respect that. Um, so Frank's going to actually talk to a supplier example here, and Frank, I'll let you go for this one. Sure. This was a uh, an example of a supplier who was uh, having uh, an issue with the experience of increased volume uh, with shortage claims specifically. Uh, they had limited resources. resources. Um, they showed that their shortages were on a rise. They had multiple uh, divisions and different sign-ins that needed to be done. So they needed to, they were manually uh, pulling PODs, validating the shipments. Once they were obtained, um, they were manually entering the disputes uh, to the various portal, taking the dispute number, tracking it, entering it and one was entering on manually until they actually utilized some automation to do um, and reviewing the responses they would go in there and continuously review however based on their resources they couldn't keep up with the amount of shortages and the demands that were coming through then they implemented <clears throat> some automation was uh, put in place whether it was ai and also robotics they were able to retrieve PODs very quickly. Um, they were also able to get that information, extracting the PODs. They were instantly disputing these claims directly to the supplier portal with attaching the POD support. Also, during that whole uh, time, they were getting promptings of claim statuses, and they were also getting constant updated of what's being what's occurring with that claim. So if it's, there's no change, it is still pending, they would get those notifications of being looked at and also maintaining that level um, of communication going back and forth um, so they understood where their claims stand out. <clears throat> Value, the impact that took place, one, well, reducing personal time and gathering the information. Uh, what was another important point, it was gave them a peace of mind that the deductions were getting the attention that they were needed. They were actually being addressed. They didn't have to worry about not having a timeline to pull up a POD that's only available for 30 or 60 days. They were able to meet the timeline requirements of having it addressed and disputed on, uh, directly to the, uh, the portal. Um, also, what took place overall, they increased their overall recoveries in invalid shortages being taken. So that was also a plus that they actually had more revenue generated to the bottom line. 
Good, Frank. Thanks. And Patty, we're um, I know we're on the uh, 30 minute mark. Um, it's the last slide and um, we'd like to open it up for questions. Sounds good. I'm glad to do that. Um, did you you saying this is the last slide so you've completed or did you have something else to speak to on this? No, we're done. We're done, actually. OK, um, excellent. Then thank you very much for your presentation and your insights. Attendees, I'm going to unmute everyone. So if you have any questions and you would like to be able to ask them directly, you certainly can. Um, you should be able to just click the unmute button to be able to speak, or you can individually uh, put your questions into the control panel's question drop-down list, and I will read them out for you. Okay, uh, all right, so first question I am seeing here is, have you seen automation assist with return handling? Uh, um, actually, sure. Yes, we have seen benefits where automation has assisted with return handling, um, especially with the matching of debits um, to credits. Uh, one particular customer uh, utilizes RPAs to retrieve the debit memo information. And since the retailer used part of the debit memo reference when returning goods, um, we had automation scrape that partial number from the debit memo. Once the credit is created or available, um, there was then an auto match that was run, clearing the dedu deduction or offsetting the deduction to the return credit. Uh, this particular customer actually used this um, process for Amazon, CVS, and I believe there were a couple other retailers. But yes, we've seen that help some returns. Excellent, always a good thing. Um, in terms of IT time, technology um, time for setup, how much would be required? Yeah, it's a, I'll take this one, Frank. Um, it's a good question. Uh, you know, essentially, um, it takes about a couple of days to get all the information together uh, and, and get a, a robot working up and running. Um, and really, the IT time is probably you know, if it's if it's a tool that IT is comfortable using, or you know, uh, environments like ours where we use our own tools, so we we're we're, we're comfortable using it, obviously, uh, internally. Um, you know, it takes a, a couple of hours, two to three hours, to set set it up. Um, and the more complex routines, by three. The less complex ones, one. But really, the biggest time is is the specking out and and trying to. Uh, understand what your process is within the portal or within that email and what you'd like to do with the robot. And so we spend more time in the planning and design than we do in the actual engineering and, and setup. Okay, and that makes good sense to me in terms of like customizing it for each each individual who's going to be using it, each individual company. All right, and then, um, as I said, you are able to unmute yourself and ask questions, but if not, if you want to continue to use the chat box to, to give me any questions, I can read those out. In the event that we have multiple divisions dealing with the same portal, same retail portal, and multiple geographies that are being covered, can these bots be trained to handle that level of detail? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, um, and, and I think that we the one we get a lot from our clients where you know, you've got multiple divisions, let's say selling to, as an example, maybe it's Amazon worldwide. So Amazon has different vendor central uh, sub portals, if I could call it that, uh, being able to go into those, but also track uh, differential rules between your different business units or between your different SKUs. So you might have different standards across different business units. And so, um, you know, the, or different processes or different policies. And so these robots uh, can be tuned, right, to handle that level of divisional change or, you know, multi-large uh, global retailer portal structures where it's all brought together, gives you a hierarchy within which you get the total exposure to the retailer, but it cleanly lays out, right, where you should, um, where your focus is, depending on which market you cover. So if you're a user sitting in Europe, you should be looking at only European-related deductions, right? So. Those are things that are increasingly very simple, and obviously those robots are programmed to deliver the data into the different systems, whether it's a third-party system or an ERP, uh, to the right users. Thank 
Thank you very much. Um, I have run through the questions that were submitted in writing. Is there anyone who has any question that they would like to ask directly? You should be able to unmute yourself at this time just by clicking the microphone in your control panel. Okay, I'm not I'm not seeing anything at this time. Do you have any final comments, Shayar or Frank, before we close out? No, I, I would just uh, like to thank everybody for their time. Uh, hopefully, we've been able to address um, some some basic questions. Uh, we look forward to kind of digging in. You know, our thoughts were to do uh, further, um, you know, drill downs into this topic and deductions generally. Uh, we we welcome feedback to. Patty and the RBCF organization, always looking for ways to enhance what we do and contribute to the community as best we can. So thank you all for your time from your day. Yes, thank, thank you all. Thank you kindly. Oh, everyone, thank you for attending. A link to the on-demand version of this webinar will be sent to you following the program. And if you have any further questions, I will also send out you contact information for Shayash and for Frank. Thank you and have a great day. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, I'm so sorry. We just had a quick question come in, just, just in the nick of time, if you have a moment to hang on. Um, sure. So we have the question of how much is the cost of this program, and is there a monthly maintenance fee? So that really varies. I mean, we, um, you know, it depends on the robot. Uh, and uh, yes, there is a monthly maintenance fee. Um, you know, you get um, the typically... Um, setting up a robot can be anything between, you know, a uh, thousand to three thousand uh, dollars, and um, you know, just to give you a, a very rough range. Um, and you know, obviously, a, a, an ongoing fee typically would be, um, you know, um, several hundred dollars uh, a month. I mean, a, a year in a subscription basis to just keep the uh, to keep the maintenance and the running of the program. So, but it really depends on the on the on the robot you have and uh, uh, and what you're trying to do and how complex the process is. So I'm I'm sort of um, decidedly vague, but I hopefully address the general ballpark of where these numbers land. And, and if there's any further discussion on it, you can reach out to Sharish or myself, and we could discuss maybe your particular need, what's needed, and give you more of a deep dive of the true cost. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Anybody else typing at this moment and have another question that they're about to pop up with? We'll give you a breath before we log off. Okay, I'm not seeing anything come in, so I think we'll let everybody go at this point and we'll send you out more information. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Bye, I appreciate the last question as well. Thank you. Bye. Bye.